gold is for war. You, you need to have it in a, in, a, in a shed somewhere, just in case the worst happens. I mean, you, you don't have to be too clever to spot the amount of, of geopolitical conflict going on on the internet. I mean, you see a news article that's making some claim and you follow it back and it will be coming out of some propaganda unit in Hungary or, or in, or, or in you know, Qatar or, or America even. All this geopolitical um, propaganda that's been pumped out onto the internet is enough warning to show you that tensions are increasing. The fact that they're fighting these propaganda wars in front of your own eyes. So, you know, I think geopolitics, the risk of Armageddon is, is going to be an increasing factor over the next long time, long time. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the HJR Mining Guy, the HJR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group, and of course your host for this channel. And I'm really looking forward to this upcoming conversation. It's with a first-time guest. It's with Clem Chambers. He's he's an accomplished author. You might have seen him on CNBC, CNN, Bloomberg, and all the other TV and mainstream news media because he's an accomplished writer, financial writer. He has a good sense of what is happening in the markets, and he can really help us make sense of what is going on. I just had the pleasure of chatting with him for about 10 minutes before hitting the record button, and I'm looking forward to recording what we discussed and really looking forward to his takes on a number of things. We have to talk about Fed. Uh, the Fed, Jerome Powell, spoke in Jackson Hole late last week. Uh, we got to sort of go through what he, what he said and really work through the market expectations, because I'm quite curious on Clem's take here as well, because uh, Jerome Powell said a few things that have me, I wouldn't say spooked, but uh, I'm, I'm listening carefully and uh, trying to figure out what the market is making of it as well. Um, Glenn is also an author of a number one bestseller. He's like one, 101 ways to pick a stock market, uh, to pick a stock market winner. And I'm really curious, like what his take on this current market is, because uh, we're topping out at 5,600 points in the S&P. Where can we make some money? Where can we make some profits? And uh, maybe Clem has the golden formula for us. But uh, before I switch over to my guests, hit that like and subscribe button. It helps us out tremendously, reaching a wider audience and educate. Thank you so much. Now, without much further ado, Clem, it is a great pleasure to have you on the channel. Thank you so much for making the time. That's my pleasure. And by the way, hit the bell. Don't forget to hit the bell, otherwise you won't get further notifications from YouTube to come and see this excellent channel. If he's going to big me up like that, I'm going to big him up too. You know, it's, it's scratch my back and I'll scratch his. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that, Clem. No, absolutely. Hit that like and subscribe button. Hit that alarm button as well. That way you get push notifications. Absolutely. Clem, it is a great pleasure to have you on, but uh, let, let's dive right in. We have a lot to go through, lots to discuss. Um, let's start with the overall economic situation. How nervous are you right now and how confident are you in the strength of the markets? Well... <sighs> If you look at the U.S. market, it has been incredibly strong for a very long time. And, you know, it's up at incredible nosebleed heights, mainly because of a few stocks that are now worth trillions and trillions. So, you know, if you're a value investor, then you're going to be looking elsewhere. But I don't think anything bad is going to happen to the market. And maybe it'll just continue to be a little bit strong right the way up to the election. Because unlike um, people who kind of worry about um, the Fed saying this and the Fed saying that, I don't think anybody's going to rock the boat until after the election because it's so politically charged now to say that X has, well, X is a good example, but, you know, someone has interfered with the election. And the Fed is not going to put itself in front of that machine gun by doing anything that might influence the market, like crash it, for example, or make it rally hard. What they will do is what they will have to do. And so I don't think they're going to be doing anything that will be heavily influential um, in the market enough to affect the election. I think they'll be keeping it uh, very much on a steady kill. Th that's a really good entry to, to what, what I want to discuss with you. It's really what Jerome Powell said at Jackson Hole. And I've, I've mentioned to you, I've, I've picked like two quotes from the from his press conference, which stood out to me a little bit because it gives me you know a second to pause because it might signal something more drastic, in my opinion. One is, uh, we do not seek or welcome further cooling in labor market conditions. That's an exact quote from Jerome Powell. And I wonder, like, how, how, how do you interpret that? We're at a four, four handle, 4% four, 4 4 4.1% unemployment rate, which doesn't sound as bad, almost sounds like full employment. Um, but why, is he so, why does he sound so nervous? Well, I mean, first of all, you have to realize with all these things, there's huge momentum. So if you've got a move in unemployment from, say, three to four percent, you just can't stop it. It's going to run to five and maybe six. So you've really got to catch it early and you've really got to try to smooth things out if you're in the position of the Fed. 
So, you know, there are times when you're going to get the sort of inflation that we have because of COVID back then. But that runaway train, you just can't stop it dead in its tracks. And when you do slow things down, what happens next has a big momentum. A, an economy like America really is the ultimate super tanker. You just can't turn it around on a dime. You have to start to move things early. So if you don't want it to get to 6%, you have to move at 4%. And you know you have to put interest rates up early and you have to take them down early too. So I think you're seeing what the Fed has been very good at, managing a really wild economic situation caused by COVID and the after effects of COVID. So they are signaling early what they're going to do. So there's no surprise. It's the surprises. It's the unknown unknowns, the unexpected that move the markets in dramatic ways. If you just slip out the information slowly but surely, everybody works it out. And once they've worked it out, it doesn't actually cause any you know, big bangs. And that's what they want to avoid. They don't want to have a situation where things suddenly go crazy. They want it to be smooth because there's actually a value to the whole economy to have a, a lower amount of volatility in the way things are. Because volatility is risk and risk will hurt um, the economy if you have too much of it. Maybe just to follow up on one point you mentioned, is like catch it early. I think Jerome Powell always says like we want to front run the market and front run like bad economic data and be uh, proactive instead of reactive. Right. And then you hear market voices. I think David Rosenberg mentions like, well, we should be at four percent Fed, uh, Fed funds rate already. Like, where, where, where do you stand? Like, maybe just to sort of regurgitate that point that you just made, but uh, maybe clarify, like, is the Fed on the right track? Like, or are they behind the eight ball already? Well, I, th I think they've been behind an eight ball that in a game pool that they haven't set up to play. I mean, you, you have to realize that if you stop the world economy for a couple of years, All sorts of crazy stuff is going to happen. All sorts of really bad stuff could happen. And they've actually managed to dig their way out of a really, really deep hole over the last couple of years, couple of three years now. So that is a remarkable achievement. And, you know, all these, um, you know, captain hindsight out there, that's one thing, but actually have to find your way out of, of this economic maze that we've been in, there's been, I think, a remarkable achievement that's been achieved by all these central banks. I wouldn't put that down to the governments who are still making trouble with their massive deficits. But actual central banks have kept things on the rail. And of course, you know, the thing about accidents, if they don't happen, nobody takes what they could have been like seriously. Nobody takes a disaster that didn't happen as seriously as, you know, something even minor that did happen. And there was plenty of disasters that could have happened after COVID. That haven't happened and that's down to pretty much the central banks and you know i think that that um that they really just don't get credit for that they don't get credit for all the crashes they've avoided i mean now they they stopped that from happening when the yen carry trade blew up only a few weeks ago they stopped that from turning into a major crisis but of course nobody's going to say oh, oh yes well they've saved us from a major crisis they're going to go well it was going to happen was it no no it's not them it's something else but really they can take a lot of credit for what hasn't happened and you know where we are now is a lot better than what it could have been and i, I don't mean to come across as you know happy fluffy bunny on these things but i think the fed has done a remarkably good job navigating out a really a nightmare scenario when it comes to the, the American and the global economy. Yeah, no, in interesting points. And maybe to follow up on that as well, like one thing Jerome Powell said on Friday in, in Jackson Hole was inflation and labor market data show an evolving situation, which sort of signals to me is like, okay, we're trending the right direction. It's time to do something because those are the two ma main mandates the Fed has is manage inflation, manage the labor market. Um, on, on the topic of inflation there, Clem, like, do, do, do you agree? Like what kind of inflation indicators do you look at? Do you look at government supplied CPI data? Do you, do you believe on your own, let's call it the wallet index? Uh, or do you look at like trueflation? Where, where, where do you see things trending? Well, inflation is very, very difficult because without a doubt, the inflation numbers are heavily curated, i.e. fudged. So it's very difficult to know what real inflation is. And the funny thing, I was talking to the true inflation guys a couple of years ago, and they were saying how they measured it properly. And then when they measured it, it was actually lower than the official figures. And I, I, I thought that was kind of you know ironic. But what is the true inflation? It's very difficult to know, because if you think about 
all the machinery, all the computers, all the electronics, all the technology that have brought down various prices. And then other things that have pushed up prices. It's a very mixed picture. But to me, there's a lot more inflation out there than has been measured by lots of different people. And when you think about it, what is a good measure of inflation? And my favorite one is the cost of a haircut, because there's no technology in haircuts. There's only the basic cost of a building, electricity, a pair of scissors and a person. And so you can get a good feel for what real inflation is like by looking at those sort of things. But if you look at inflation, say, in the UK, um, they reckon there's been 300 percent inflation since 1983, whereas the price of a car has gone up 500 percent. So how can it only be 300 percent when basic things like cars have gone up five times? So really, the inflation numbers are very, very hard to track and know. But I think inflation is higher and it's actually going to remain higher than they say it is. Interest rates will come down, but there will be this quite strong creeping inflation that will keep people on their toes when it comes to, you know, what's going on with prices. Based on what we just discussed, labor market inflation, what, what do you expect the Fed to do September 18th? Is it going to be quarter basis or 25 basis point cut, 50 basis point cut, and also the symbolism behind it and, and timing? You mentioned timing before the U.S. elections. Like, where, where do you think they'll put their eggs in what basket? What if, if they've got any sense, they just bring it down slowly. I mean, why why bring it down a half? What, what, what would they be saying? I think the Fed in particular, especially, is very keen to send the right message. And they're going to send the message of stability. And that is the most important message from their point of view, because a stable economy is what they need. They don't want disjunctions. They don't want, you know, suddenly new situations to occur out of nowhere. They want people to know what is going to happen roughly over the next three, six months, a year in a kind of cone of probability. All those dot prints are to give you a steer. So anybody who really wants to know can look at what they're saying and kind of read between the lines and kind of get to what's going to happen unless something crops up. And then if it does crop up, then there'll be a change in policy. You can see that actually quite clearly in their balance sheet because the balance sheet is really the important thing. You can forget interest rates. You can forget inflation. What you should look at if you want to see what's coming is what's in the Fed's balance sheet and what they're doing with that and what's in the reverse repo, which is basically a measure of excess money. And if there's too much money in the system, you're going to get inflation. Well, funny enough, they were bringing down the excess money and they stopped a couple of months ago and they've held it pretty much flat. So that shows you they want to keep things kind of as they are without any major positives or negatives. And the balance sheet. When the secondary banking crisis came up, the regional banking crisis in the US came up, um, well, it's just over a year ago now, up went their balance sheet. And then as soon as that was sorted, down it went again, carried on the same trajectory. So you can see the trajectory just by looking at their balance sheet. And you can see what they think is going on by looking at the amount of excess money there is in the system. And you can see that in the reverse repo numbers that they give out. Which is really interesting. It brings me a bit to what you mentioned earlier is the yen carry trade and how they handled that. And I, I wanted to dive a little deeper into that because I, th I feel like that wasn't really discussed in mainstream media. At least I haven't read too much about it. August 5th is a big date where, uh, you know, all the algorithms and everybody went uh, haywire and tried to exit the market. A lot of a bigger liquidity event. Um, we have to talk about it. Like, how did the Fed handle that situation and uh, that mass exodus of liquidity out of the markets? Well, the, the thing that people need to think about is that the world has changed. In the old days, it was all about interest rates. You know, if you want inflation to come down, you put up interest rates, everyone goes bust. And then, you know, uh, people um, you know, haven't got the money to buy um, things with. So demand drops and therefore prices drop or the rise in prices drop. And it's a simple way of, of controlling money supply just by either grabbing people by the throat and choking them off or by sharing them with money. Well, actually, that's the new way or making it easy for them to borrow money and cheap to borrow money. So that was the the lever. And when you think about it, that's the big lever that used to be used to control the economy and everything that went along with it. And they're moving it in quarter of a percent, which is a really unsubtle way of doing it. And it's really like a sledgehammer. Um, in China, they do it in 0.1 percent. In America in the, and in the developed world, it's a quarter of a percent, which is, you know, not very subtle, is it? Not very sophisticated. But that's the old way of doing it. The new way of doing it, 
the way that came in after the financial crisis of 2007, 8, 9, was that it's just about the availability of money in the system. So they will push money into the system. It doesn't matter what the interest rate is. Push money into the system and push it onto people who want it. And who doesn't want to have money, right? I mean, a 1% more on interest rates might cramp a few people, but it's the ability to get money that's the most important thing. If you say to companies, you can't have any more money, you can't roll those debts, they just go bust, right? So actually underneath the cost of money is the actual availability. And these days, they just manipulate the availability of money to uh, manipulate inflation and economic growth or otherwise. So when you have a situation like the carry trade blowing up, where everybody's scraping around to get money to pay off their part of the chain of transactions, the Fed just goes and the Japanese just go and the European banks just go, you want money? Here it is. Yeah, you want money? Yeah, have it. How much do you want? There you go. Give it back to me in a month. So they make sure that nobody can't get the money they need in the chain of the transactions in the economic system. And they make it easy. They they make liquidity, which is in the old world is cash. Nobody goes hungry. No institution can't get their hands on money to pay their bill at the end of the week, month, wherever. So that's how they make sure that all those banks that probably might have gone bust, all those traders that might have gone bust, all those people with these carry trades that might have gone bust, they don't go bust because their counterparties that had to pay their bills that wouldn't have can pay their bills. So the overall, the system keeps going. It doesn't actually break the system. And so that's the way that they ride out these things these days by making money available to the system in situations where it would have actually frozen up. And, you know, that's what happened in 2000 and 2008. What happened was the credit market froze up. You just couldn't get money. So everybody went bust. Well, they've realized now that they can just say, you want money? It's here. You're going to have to give it back. And that will save markets and economies from these systemic defaults, which is what they're trying to avoid and have been avoiding ever since then which has saved us from, you know, really some pretty dark economic times. Well, you brought up money supply, and I just went on uh, the Fred website to look at uh, M2 Money Supply, and uh, it's been increasing again. And um, maybe we'll have to talk about that. What, what are the ramifications of that? Because if I look at increasing money supply, I keep coming back to inflation and rising inflation. Is like, is that correlation still intact, and how worried are you about it? Well, uh, there's these huge fiscal debts out there, and they're not going to go away. Well, they are going to go away. It's called inflation. And they don't go away overnight. They go away over the long term. So whereas you might have liked to have a 2% inflation rate, you have a 2.5 or 3. Or you might like to have a 2% and you have a 2%, but actually it's 4. Because it's 4, because if you count it up that way, it's actually 4. It's a 4% or 5% inflation rate when it comes to the value of the pot of money that is being are borrowed from the people that are lending it to governments because there are different inflation rates there's rich man's inflation and there's poor man's inflation rich man's inflation is his mansion he wants to buy has gone up five million or his lamborghini's doubled so the lamborghini was going to buy is not 300 grand anymore it's 600 the rolex he was going to pay 25 grand for is now 300 grand you know like we saw a few years ago that's rich man's inflation poor man's inflation is the price of gas has gone up or, or lettuce has gone up or 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 mcdonald's has gone up and these things move in different rates so as far as governments are concerned they want as high inflation as possible that affects the sort of money that they borrowed yeah and that will be different from the inflation rate in the supermarket and different than the inflation rate of mansions in you know orange county but that intrinsic inflation rate has to be higher than two percent because there's no other way they're going to dig themselves out of this ever increasing debt pile. The only way to bring it down is to bring down the real value of it. And that's been a strategy ever since the Roman Empire. I mean, if you look at the American cent, the old cent of the 1860s, it was that big. And then it was a tiny little copper coin and there's too much copper in it. So now it's a zinc clad. So the actual um, value of money has come down and that's been created by inflation. And the thing to remember is there's only one type of organization that can cause inflation and that is government no one else causes it only government causes it and they don't cause it by accident they cause it on purpose 
or they don't have it on purpose. I mean, Japan has deflation. It's not by accident. It's because they want deflation for their own political reasons. And if they want high inflation, they have high inflation. And funny enough, the Japanese are saying, oh, we don't know how to make inflation. Oh, I wish we did. We'd have 2% if we did. Yeah, why don't they ring up Venezuela and ask them to borrow their finance minister for a few hours? You know, governments get the inflation rate they want to have or they need to have for their political purposes. And so, you know, now with these big fiscal debts forever growing, the only solution to that, and it's always been the case, is inflation. And you can see that on the history of inflation in the 20th century. You can see, funny enough, after a war, you get rampant inflation. Well, COVID wasn't quite a war, but a lot of people died in it and a lot of economic damage was done. So guess what we've got afterwards? Oh, high inflation. Yeah, I, I just looked up the German history again. I'm German and, and I wish I was way more familiar with it. But German hyperinflation of the 1920s, of course. So we tried to inflate our way out of debt. It was ridiculous, but uh, we, we didn't succeed. I was trying to inflate the way out of reparations. Exactly. But we, but we didn't succeed. Right. So in the end, we had to get a new currency. Right. So it's like the question is, of course, now looking at the, the U.S. debt that burden of $35 trillion. And uh, I think during the height of inflation at 8%, somebody mentioned to me, it takes 40 years to even inflate our way out of debt. It's not really feasible. So the question is like, w w what's what's the next step here? Like you're talking- well, What's wrong with 40 years? Say, say I mean, again, think, sir? Th what's wrong with 40 years? What, what was the price of a McDonald's 40 years ago? That's a good question, actually. Yeah, it, probably it, quarter bet, or something for a, a for a Big Mac. Yeah, I bet it was a third of what it was now, or maybe even a fifth. Yeah. So, yeah, you can do it. But the trouble is the politicians just go borrow more. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem. But if you if you want to be kept in hindsight uh, usefully, all you've got to do is look at the strength of the dollar. It's a strong currency. And, and you know, the currency marks do not mess around in dreamland. Mm -hmm. You know, that is the strength because that is the strength. And when you look at other currencies, the euro is a strong currency. The yen is a pretty strong currency. Look at the Turkish lira. Count the zeros. Yeah. Look at the whatever the Venezuelan Bolivar, whatever currency they've kind of got there, or any South American currency. All those zeros, right? So, you know, as a currency, it has a, even though the cent is now a copper clad bit of zinc, yeah, it still kept its value relatively. It's still dealing in one dollar after all those years. However, I mean, one dollar was a gold coin back in the 18th century. Yeah, and now it's a, well, it's still a piece of paper. It still manages to be a piece of paper. They've tried to force the dollar coin onto Americans and they haven't accepted them as, a, as a, something they want. It's still, a, it's still you know, a unit which is, which is looked upon as a unit. People aren't thinking in terms of five dollars yet as being the unit or ten dollars as being the unit. It's still a dollar. So it's still hanging on in there 200 years. That's not bad going. The yen was a gold coin at the, about the same time as the dollar was a gold coin. And now, of course, the, the uh, yen is not a gold coin anymore. And, and it's an aluminium coin. Jeez. That's, that's not good. Um, Clem, I had Larry McDonald here uh, on the channel uh, la last week, and we published the interview just this past Sunday. And he mentioned that the Fed might slowly introduce a new inflation rate target. Which, which he thinks could be 3%, moving away would from make the 2%. Perfect sense. It's would like, make exactly like, perfect sense. Like, how would they sell it? Like, what, what would be a way where they, how they could sell it? Because the 2% was an arbitrary number grabbed from history. I but, can sell uh, it to you. I can sell yeah. it to you. Look, inflation pays the economically active. Yeah, because they're out there doing stuff. They, they make money. They put the prices up. They pay themselves more. They get on with it. They buy a building for X and sell it for X plus Y. They're out there making stuff happen. It hurts the economically passive. It hurts the savers. It hurts the people that are retired. It hurts the people that don't work. It hurts people that are not economically active. So we want to get our economy more active. And therefore, we're prepared to have a little bit more inflation to reward the economically active and, you know, take advantage of the, those that have got capital who are the economically passive. Now, they pro probably wouldn't say that last bit, but it's a transfer of wealth between the passive to the active. Yeah, it's like any any highly volatile situation. You know, risk equals reward as long as you're taking the risks. And inflation is a, is a more risky environment. So as long as you don't overdo it and have huge inflation, as long as you have a little bit more, you have a little bit more juice in the system. You have the a little bit more boom, a little bit more sizzle. 
And, you know, that is not necessarily a bad thing. And 2 and 3%, I mean, oh, it's painful in the long term. But really, it's not at the end of the world. 5%, that starts to get a bit spicy. 7%, you're probably, oh, you know, you're probably suffering. 10%, you're, you're kind of on the road to, to destruction. 20%, you're over the edge. But 2 to 3%, you know. Potato, potato, or tomato, tomato, right? Same, same thing. Um, w w one thing I want to ask you earlier is like, and I couldn't fit it in, was disinflation versus deflation. Right now, we're definitely in a disinflationary scenario, but to looking at like the true inflation, uh, inflation index, we're at 1.47%. How worried are you about deflation and uh, potential consequences here? Well, as I said, it's all about the money supply. It's all about the, the <laughs> you see, people think of money like cash in their pocket, right? But there's money has different values depending on how liquid it is. Now, if you've got a, um, a house and you live in it and it's worth a million bucks, but you can't borrow money, you haven't got any cash and your car's out of gas. Well, you've got a problem, haven't you? Yeah, it doesn't matter. You've got this asset. So you go to the bank, go, duh, 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 my car's run out of gas. Please um, lend me some money because I've got to put. And gas in my car because I've got to drive something important. And they say, oh, no, can't borrow money, no. Well, you're snookered, aren't you? Yeah. So that is one of the drivers of this whole new economic system is how close your assets or your money is to cash, to, you know, the sort of cash that you can put in your pocket or put on your debit card or, or, or whatever. Yeah. So if you've got highly illiquid assets, That's not so, you know, that's not so interesting. So if you wanted to put down inflation, for example, you would push the money supply into less liquid assets, assets that are hard to turn into cash to go down to the supermarket and buy a lettuce with or to go into a bank and buy a house with. Yeah. So one of the ways to bring down inflation is just to push the, the, the money away from the liquid end towards the illiquid end in the same way as you do that with bonds. So, you know, the closer the bonds are to turning into cash, the, the more um, they are uh, spicy and the more they're likely to drive inflation. So if you were to push the bond yields back to, to older, um, more long term bonds, you would take some of the energy out of the economy. And that's what they do these days. They just change the profile of liquidity of all the money that's out there. And that is what affects inflation. Okay. Does that make no, I appreciate you. Clear. Yeah, no, I appreciate you clarifying that. It makes a lot of sense. And uh, it's interesting to put that all into context because now like, sort of my follow-up question is now, what is the market pricing in here? And uh, we talked about the Fed rate cuts, of course, but I'm looking at an S&P 500 of 5,600 points, 10-year U.S. bond, 3.9%, gold at 25.16 an ounce, uh, the Dixie at 100.7. So like, what, what is the market pricing in and is it overreacting to maybe something the Fed has said? Well, there's... <laughs> I think the way to look at the market right now is there's a dirty great put in the market. They're not going to let the market crash right now, not up until someone's been elected. Yeah. And, you know, that 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 encourages positiveness, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, one's going to walk over a high wire if there's no net. And the moment, you know, it's obvious there's going to be a dirty great safety net underneath the market because no one's going to want to see it crash before the election. People are going to get a little bit, you know, more risk tolerant, aren't they? So I think that's a, a, a big deal. I think gold, I, I'm not a gold fanboy. I've got a reasonable chunks of it, but I'm, I'm, I have it as part of a diversified portfolio. But I look at the chart and it says it's going to go mental. And I, you know, I don't know why. I hope it's not for a bad reason. But gold definitely looks like it could go to 3,000. It looks like it could go to 4,000. What causes that? I do not know. But the thing you have to realize is there's a lot of people in this world and a lot of people in the know or with an idea of the balance of probabilities going forward that we might not have the foggiest clue about it. So certain assets, when they move, it gives you a steer of what could happen. It doesn't mean it's going to happen, but it says what could happen. And, you know, at the moment, gold says, you know, it's going places. Now, I personally think it's probably going to be a repricing that reprices gold in terms of the inflation that we've already had. Because commodities don't all move at the same time. And if you've got a 10% to a 12% inflation, 
uh, commodities do not go up 1% a month. They just sit around and suddenly, bang, they go up in a, in a vertical. So inflation tends to ooze into the market, into different commodities and different things over different times, depending on what's, you know, what's shaking at any one moment. So I think what this could be is just gold's time to actually get the, um, the price of value of money into it, actual price over the next you know, few months. So it's repricing effectively for what's already happened. So I, I think that's probably what we're seeing with gold and silver and those commodities. And you've seen all sorts of crazy uh, commodity spikes. And if you go back to the 70s, you know, as I, I started out in the 70s as a child interested in the markets. And, you know, first it was oil, then it was um, sugar, and then it was cocoa. All the commodities kind of exploded at different times over about a three year period. So I, I think that's probably what we're seeing here with gold right now. It's it's just its turn to reprice. Clem, I just want to follow up on silver. You mentioned you threw it in the mix there, but it's behaving rather oddly right now in 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 terms of the correlation with gold. It is lagging behind massively. Like, um, it, would you would you put that in the category? Oh, that's normal behavior. We'll we'll see it spike up at some point, or should we be worried about silver? Well, I, I, I'm I've bought a bit of silver recently. I, I've I've liked silver because silver is you know the fastest horse, um, and it is it is the the using that word again spicy. And precious metal and on the other end of it you look at platinum palladium i mean you know they're as dead as a door now and i like them too but you know as diversified portfolios of risk they're good to have a splash so you know two percent of your portfolio in gold maybe one percent in silver that kind of thing and yes if gold goes silver will go also the thing about gold I, I, people you know love gold uh, and it's you know, what's not to love. It's a lovely thing. But you've got to ask yourself, what is the purpose of gold? Why do countries store piles and piles of gold? It's not because they're going to be minting coins and turning it into currency. So why are they doing that? Well, it's a very simple answer. It's not a very happy answer, but it's a very simple one. Gold is for war. And you should think about that. Because if you're at war, you've got to pay in gold. And you stick it in a submarine and you send it to the people that are shipping you tanks or whatever. And that's what gold's for. Gold is for war. Now, silver is way too light for it, for its value. But gold has got that weight. You can ship, you know, a ton of gold is whatever it is. Is it like 100 million now? But anyway, it's a lot of money. So you can get a few tons, can buy you quite a lot of stuff in war, and you can ship it about. So gold is for war. So one of the reasons why gold is probably moving too is that a lot of countries are stocking up on it now because they feel that there's a rise in geopolitical tension and you know gold is for war you you need to have it in a in a in a shed somewhere just in case the worst happens so one of the reasons why you can have a difference in movement between silver and gold is because silver isn't valuable enough now you sort of uh, took away my next question is like how geopolitical are the markets right now you you mentioned gold um like if you look at the price move like how geopolitical and how monetary driven is is, is the price move right now because uh, often we've seen like geopolitical gold prices have short legs um they usually fall over at some point and just deflate um wh what category would you put that price move in right now well for gold yeah, like how, like if or even give it a percentage, probably the better question of it is uh, geopolitical gold, move versus monetary sort of safe haven investing. I think gold is repricing. I, I think the everybody probably can feel that there's an increase in geopolitical risk. I mean that that's one way of putting it. Another way of putting it is there's certainly a fair share of lunatics out there ruling countries at the moment. And and that sort of insane behavior seems to be on the rise. And, it, you know, it's not just limited to, you know, strange developing countries anymore. So I, I think the, the level of of uh, volatility in governance, huh? why don't we put it like that? <laughs> the level of volatility in governance um, is apparently increasing. And I think obviously those um, countries and other countries are spotting that and, and are, are acting accordingly. And I think that will be having a long term impact on gold. Now, the thing you have to remember about gold, gold has inflation. Gold has a lot of inflation. They're digging it out of the ground all the time. And depending on how you want to count it, i.e. how much gold is there in free flow and how much is being dug out of the ground, and you can look that up yourself, you can judge how much more gold is coming to market every year. 
So it does need to be, you know, sucked up. And of course, governments can do that quite easily. So I think the gold supply is being matched by an increase in demand. And then you've got this inflation thing underneath it as well. So you've got a tailwinds. And, you know, geopolitics is going to be an ever increasing element because, I mean, you don't have to be too clever to spot the amount of, of geopolitical conflict going on on the Internet. I mean, you see a news article that's making some claim and you follow it back and it will be coming out of some propaganda unit in Hungary or, or in or, or in you know, Qatar or, or America even. All this geopolitical um, propaganda that's been pumped out into the Internet is enough warning to show you that tensions are increasing. The fact that they're fighting these propaganda wars in front of your own eyes. So, you know, I think geopolitics, the risk of Armageddon is is going to be an increasing factor over the next long time, I think, long time. Now, Glenn, uh, Glenn maybe last, last question. It really fits in, uh, you know, what we just mentioned. is like we're in, living in extremely volatile times. Um, how do you pick a stock market winner? And uh, what, what are you looking for these days? Give, maybe given some, some time context here as well, maybe until the end of the year, how would you pick a winner right now? Well... OK, so so the, there's there's my book is 101 ways. OK, and I was told <laughs> off by some um, a, a magazine editor. So what is 101 ways? There should only be six, you know, but <laughs> there are many little ways, little tells that you can put together of, on your own. And you go, oh, when this happens, when a company's been doing really, really badly for, for five years and it gets a new CEO. Oh, I'm going to I'm going to mark that as a tick. Yeah. When a company does a buyback, I, I, I'm not a fan of buybacks, but that's another example. Tick. So you, you put your things that you consider to be positive functions and you just stack them up. And when they're long, you've got enough of them and they score high enough for you. then you go, that is a winner because they've got these tailwinds behind them. Yeah. You can do something simple like, well, AI is going to boil the oceans and therefore I'm going to buy a refrigerating plant company. Bang. That That is one way to do it. But I prefer just to stack up a whole list of positive functions. I mean, I'm a value investor. I love cheap companies. And I go low PE, strong dividend, um, lots of sales um, in relationship to their um, market cap, and so on and so forth. All the stuff that, that Warren Buffett has made himself rich with. You know, you can't really go far wrong with that kind of um, Benjamin Graham investing. And, th and that's what I tend to do. And otherwise, the only other way to do it is you just see a company that rings all your bells. I mean, there's something that I was taught. Um, actually, I was at waist deep in a cold river in Scotland, and I was panning for gold. And the gold panner said to me, if you think it's gold, it isn't. If you know it's gold, it is. And it makes no sense until you find a piece of gold and you go, that is gold. And you'd be spending the whole three hours of freezing cold in the, in the water in your, in your wellies thinking you found gold, thinking you found gold, thinking you found gold. If you think it's gold, it isn't. But when you know it's gold, it is. So that's the heuristic way if you don't want to do numbers, if you don't want to grind through all the facts and figures, is wait for the one share every you know 18 months that you look at that suddenly smacks you on the forehead and says, this is the one. And then that's a good way to pick. But I prefer to just crunch numbers. Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett, read the books about them that are decent. And um, by the time you've read them, you should be, you know, pretty well clued up on how to pick sensible stocks. So, since you brought up gold and stocks, like I have to ask you, gold miners a value pick right now or not? <sighs> tough one, I know. <laughs> I no, it's not tough at all. It's just disappointing. I mean, <laughs> I, th there seems to be no um, connection between the price of gold and gold mines, and that's enough to tell you, you know, you've got to be very, very wary. What, what, what? What's going on there then? They're meant to go up way more than gold. Why haven't they gone up? What's going on there then? Nothing good, huh? <laughs> from the from the price action, yes. Definitely lagging behind. Worse than silver, to be honest. So Clem, really, really appreciate your time. It was a wonderful conversation. Where can we follow where can we follow you? Where where can we find more of your work? Um, I, I write regularly for Forbes. Um, I write for um Seeking Alpha occasionally. Um I pop up on shows like like yours um for the fun of it. And um, yes, well, you can catch up um, with me there and, and please do. Um, I've got a relatively good um, record on this stuff. And you look back to my work like over 20 years. So, you know, I've, I've got a good record of picking the tops and picking the bottoms, which is really the secret 
knowing when to leave the market and and just sit on your hands and knowing when to, when after a crash to get back in that is really the key I think it, actually you know get, getting back in after a crash is is also a very very important um, way of doing things and most people they don't get out of the top because they're too excited so and that's quite difficult but to actually have some dry powder to get back in after a really really nasty crash that's much easier and it doesn't take much skill it just takes a lot of nerve so you know perhaps that's something that your um your your viewers should think about when to get in after a crash rather than worrying about missing it should be the title of your next book is like knowing when to sell should be the next title so <laughs> or, or 100, 101 ways to know when to sell something okay. like that <laughs> 101 ways to know when to buy i think that's probably better. that's uh maybe part two is then when to sell or something like that i'm <laughs> sure there's there's a there's a sequel in there somehow we've learned from marvel and dc that there's always a sequel to be made so <laughs> <laughs> clem really really appreciate your time thank you so much for coming on and uh We'll, we'll talk soon. Everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I tremendously enjoyed this conversation with Glam. Go follow up on Amazon. Go check out his book. And, of course, follow him on, uh, you know, read his Forbes articles. Follow him in on Twitter. I, I found his X account as well. I'll put it down in the show notes down below. Let us know how we did. How did you enjoy this conversation? Did you like the conversation we had with Glam? How informative was it for you? Like, we really want to hear from you because we're making this program to be educational. We're not doing them just so I can have a good time and chat with uh, really smart people. It is for us to educate you to help make sense of what is happening in the markets what is the fed doing what are the markets doing how's gold behaving of course and much much more really appreciate you tuning in share the video with your friends and as clem said hit that like and subscribe button don't forget to hit that bell notification as well thank you so much for tuning in we'll be back with lots more here on soar financial